The world of theater is full of stars. But just like in the night sky, sometimes we don't see them all. Some are in the wings, some are maybe up over us in the catwalk. Hopefully they're not under the stage, but um, you never know. In this series, we are going to meet those hidden stars of the theater, hear their stories, and be inspired by them. So join me on this journey here in my state-of-the-art production studio in my backyard as we meet the hidden stars of theater. Hey everyone and welcome back to my camper. It is great to have you here at the Hidden Stars of Theater as it always is here in my state-of-the-art recording studio camper. Not really, but you know, it works. In my backyard where we like to hang out with some really cool people, you know the ones they are, the Hidden Stars, the ones who we don't get to celebrate through a curtain call at the end of a show, but they're just as important as those silly actors who just drops about the stage and sing and frolic and yeah, you know who they are, but we love them and we, you know, we all sacrifice for them and that's okay, but that's not who we celebrate. We celebrate those hidden stars and today's hidden star is Christine Colonna and Christine is a stage manager on Broadway, <laughs> the big B, the big apple, the big city, and we're going to hear her story today and um, you know what? We're going to jump right to it today because we've got so much to cover and we don't want to waste a minute. And so let me just welcome Christine Colonna to the Hidden Stars of Theater and my camper. Welcome, Christine. Hi, thank you for having me. Hey, thank you for being our guest. It is always, um, always great to have wonderful people and you definitely fit that category. And we're excited. Um, so as always, you know, what, what we want to do is just kind of learn uh, uh, about you and in doing so, learn uh, more about what you do and the exciting, exciting life of uh, assistant and uh, at times program stage manager um, all over, primarily in the east, right? And uh, some mm -hmm. in the south, but uh, right now in the Big Apple on uh, that big, big Broadway. So we're excited to hear your story. And um, I just, you know, as always, we ask you to start kind of at the, at the beginning and, and uh, just fill us in on what were the things in life and the people in life that influenced you towards doing what you do. But without further ado, ma'am, the stage is yours. And, you know, I should have said Ooh. when we started five to house, right? But <laughs> I always miss that opportunity That's when okay. I talk to stage managers. So, ma'am, <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, so my name is Christine Colonna. I'm originally from a small town called La Plata in Maryland, um, born and raised. Um, and uh, my theater journey began in high school, uh, late in high school. Um, a lot of my friends were into theater and, you know, were doing the school shows and stuff like that. And so they kind of peer, friendly peer pressured me into auditioning <laughs> for a show um, called Virgil, Virgil and the City Slickers, which is like a small hysterical comedy. Um, and I got my first role and it was so fun just to do a, a show with my friends and it just like kind of introduced me to the culture of theater. So like, you know, what theater people do, well, theater people in a high school setting people do. So it's just <laughs> a lot of camaraderie and, uh, that camaraderie was just so infectious that I wanted to continue that in college. And so um, when I started looking for schools, uh, my parents were like, you know, you could do theater, but you're going to have to do something else with it. And I was like, OK. Um, so I decided to do medieval history. Um, not that that's any better than theater, but. Yeah, crazy. fascinating. Um, um, you yeah. know, I understand there's a lot of careers around that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I liked um, your plan. Your plan was to think of something that could provide less things so then you would choose the theater which was what you wanted right and the parents would be pleased was that kind of the thought uh it was no like because i i actually for a moment thought i was going to like you know do theater on the side but be like some sort of like his, history professor or teacher okay or absolutely like that. yeah that's um, cool but but i think underneath it all i was like but i really want to do theater <laughs> <laughs> In a weird way. Um, so I found a college. I went to Lynchburg College, which is now uh, University of Lynchburg in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, their theater program is very small. 
which was fine. I didn't want to be in a large school and feel lost. So um, my friends, Teresa McKenzie and Amanda Warner, uh, worked in the scene shop at school with like a work study and um, kind of opened the door to another aspect of theater aside from being on the stage. So I, I got involved in the scene shop just volunteering, you know, helping build sets, paint, hang lights, things like that. Um, so also, so was, your, was your degree originally what you're working on, was it a performance degree or was it just a general theater? No, it was just a general theater, a BA in theater. Um, got you. Funny enough, it wasn't until after I graduated that they started having um, emphasis. In, oh, okay. In the, so within the theater department, so that's the way that a whole department worked. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Cool. Um, and while I thought I was still going to act, I realized in college that I have horrible stage fright, um, just awful, and kind of shied away from the acting. Um, and uh, my professor, uh, Terry Jakimiak. Um, he, who, he was profess a professor in theater, but he was also in charge of the scene shop. And so he kind of, again, encouraged me more to be in the scene shop, um, almost to the point where he would <laughs> uh, be upset with me if I didn't come to the scene shop for a day, um, because there would be times, you know, I had other commitments of, of classwork or things like that, and he would playfully uh, be upset with me. Um, as, as someone who has run a scene shop I, at, a, at a small university, yes. All of the free help you can get is a good thing. So I understand yeah. that. <laughs> I'm right there with um, you, man. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of great. Like, um, like even though he would tease me about that, it, it was very helpful and encouraging to, like, make me feel more comfortable coming back to the scene shop. And it wasn't until, like, the second semester. I, well, not even the second semester. I'm sorry. Later, my timeline's all messed up. My junior year in college, he uh, there was an opening in the scene shop to um, – to take and because I volunteered so much, he was like, you have the job if you want it. And I pounced on it. I thought that was great. So I was full time in the scene shop and he gave me the position of like master electrician and wow. I was so interested in lighting at the time. And um, it just opened my, it just opened my world. Um, and I enjoyed it so much um, being able to see the work that my friends and I did up on the stage for everyone to enjoy and to be a part of um, was really, really cool. And I really had a lot of fun and just created really great bonding experiences with friends. So you um, were really hungry for whatever theater experience you could get, it sounds like, right? I was starving for it. I just wanted to learn every aspect that I could. That's and awesome. Yeah. And, you, and you know, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't get that in high school and um, I just, this was my opportunity. This was my chance. Um, going along with that, uh, uh, one of my spring semesters there, uh, Terry came to me and was like, "So we need a stage manager for Joseph and the Tech Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat." Um, and uh, my friend Teresa would also be stage managing with me, and I had no idea what a stage manager was. Well, I kind of knew. I knew them as like this bossy person but I didn't know what they did. <laughs> I had no idea. And so he was like, don't worry. I'll teach you guys along the way. We'll figure it. You'll figure it out. It'll be okay. I was like, all right. Sure. Yeah. That's something a lot of times, you know, unless it's a really big high school or a magnet school that does performing arts all the time. Most high schools um, don't have the, uh, the privilege, the, <laughs> the advantage of having what we think of in the professional realm as an actual stage manager that yeah. that does all of those things. Although teachers out there listening, I think it would be a great thing to start doing. And plus, if you do it right and they really do their job, you'll love it because they're going to be doing a lot of the stuff you're doing right now. So yeah. look into that. Look into that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Teresa and I both stage managed it. So like she, there was instead of being like a production stage manager and assistant stage manager, we were both just the production stage manager, which is not, to the best of my knowledge, that's not nor the norm. That's not the norm. But it was great because her and I could lean on each other and learn uh, both aspects of the job, whether you're um, with a director taking blocking about where the actors need to go and whatnot, or you're backstage um, learning where props need to go when, or if people needed costume changes. So it's like we, we kind of shared the responsibility. Um, Had she ever done it before, or do you think it was no, new, for, new for both of you? new for both of us. And um, Terry taught us, like, 
some paperwork, like definitely how to write a rehearsal report to let everybody know what happened in rehearsal and um, things like that. But a lot of what we did, like, was very crude, like, not in a bad way, but just like we just did it, did what we could to get the show up and running. Right. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. just from what we learned on our own, um, which was great. Uh, so in the end, she called the show. I ran the backstage, which I fell in love with. I loved being backstage and like helping things happen when they needed to. Um, and since then, I just fell in love with it. I love stage managing. Um, it, it made me want to do it more. And I, I continued through the rest of my college career. I stage managed. I did a little bit of acting, but like mainly wanted to be in the scene shop and stage manage. Do you, um, do you, have you um, ever thought about what were the traits you think that, uh, that Terry saw in you that made him stop and say, you know what, I think she would be a great stage manager. We need to give that a shot. You know, I would like to think he saw some leadership potential. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he did. I'm sure he I, did. I think that might have been it or the fact that I lo I'm very organized. I like things. Um, I don't like any surprises when things happen, you know. Right. So I, You I like think, order, not chaos. Yeah, I like order, not chaos. So uh, I think that was probably some things he saw in me. And I think he also just wanted to give me a chance in a new aspect of the theater world. Yeah. Um, something that I haven't done before. Broaden your um, horizons. That's exactly. Good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was really thankful he did that. And he was one of the people that pushed me to go to uh, SETC, the Southeastern Theater Conference. Mm -hmm. So I actually went there two times while in college. And the first time I went, I did the job search, not literally not knowing what, like how to do this, how to navigate it. Um, which was good because then the second time I went, I was so prepared. I had my resumes, I had my portfolio and with me and a, even a, um, a stage management prompt book, um, to my interviews. Oh, that's and, good. Yeah. Um, I felt so prepared. And at that second SETC, um, I got an interview, I got, I got two jobs out of it and like a bunch of interviews. Um, so my first job was at Illinois Shakespeare Festival in okay. Bloomington, Illinois. And Terry actually helped me get that job. And um, I was a PA there, um, which was great. It was my first experience doing outdoor theater. And it was also my first experience working with truly a professional stage management team um, and kind of observing them and how they work in rehearsal and noticing that they didn't just take blocking, but they also did paperwork. Uh, like really good paperwork <laughs> for like prop lists, run sheets, costumes and things like that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is stuff I never really like thought of or learned or anything. So I really started to realize um, there's more to it than just keeping order. Right. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and, it was and also, that aspect, that aspect, I guess, obviously, if you say it's a lot of fun, appealed to you. Do you think that kind of goes with the fact that, like in college, you enjoyed every aspect of it? I mean, yeah. you kind of like to have your hands in everything, every team, every every bit of it, yes, a little I, bit of your personality. It is, it is, and and I still like. I mean, I don't get opportunities now to like jump in in the scene shop and things like that, but it, I, I still love learning about what's going to be happening. Um, because in stage management, you have to know like what's happening with scenic or, you know, if, if in rehearsal a note comes up that needs to go to scenic or costumes or props, you know, you pass that information along. So it's still like, and you follow up yeah. and, um, it's still having your hand in those things, maybe not physically, but like, you're still a part of it. And you're just like the, you're not the team leader, but you're the team facilitator, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, so, That's awesome. And I imagine for the teams you're working with, the fact that you have some, even if it's just base knowledge in each of those things has got to, uh, I mean, how many stage managers have also had the opportunity to be, you know, head electric. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great trait when your electric uh, electricians are dealing with you that mm -hmm. you, you know a lot of what they're talking about. That's got to be very beneficial. It's so beneficial. And sometimes like, even if, I mean, I've been on shows um, off Broadway where, like 
something happens before we're about to start the show and you know you don't have time to call anyone so you're the person there like oh wait I think I know what I need to do or you have to rig a prop a certain way to make sure it works for that performance before you can get somebody to come in so it's like it's a lot of um problem solving on the fly and, and a um, master of duct tape yeah master <laughs> of duct tape I prefer gaff tape but duct tape works too yeah I understand I understand <laughs> um, <laughs> That and a paper clip and you become MacGyver. So Ooh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it's a lot of fun doing that for me. Um, so after Illinois Shakes, um, literally right after I went, maybe had like a week at home in Maryland. And then I head to Riverside Theater in Beer Beach, Florida, which was my first full season at a theater. And um, did you land that through SETC? I did land that through SETC. Um, during that second SETC, uh, I had a choice between going to Riverside or doing a cruise job mm-hmm. on a cruise line, and it was the hardest <laughs> decision, but something in my gut told me to go to Riverside, and I'm so glad I did. Um, it was it just continued my education that I didn't get at uh, Lynchburg or at uh, ISF, and what I really learned at Riverside was honing in on my paperwork skills and the various different types of paperwork. So I was used to like maybe just having a prop list and some crude version of a run list uh, or a, a run sheet. And while at hey, Riverside- Can you break that down? Uh, Cause I know what a run sheet yeah. is, but we haven't, I don't think we've talked about that on an episode. So some of the, some oh, of yeah, our sure. know what a run sheet is. That'd be a great, just general knowledge thing. Sure. Um, so as a stage manager, you have various forms of paperwork. And a couple of things, a couple of examples would be um, a props list and like a props tracking. So a props list is like, as an assistant stage manager, you would read through the show um, once just for enjoyment. And then the second time I do it for gaining information. So I read it and I figure out what props are needed for the show. And I just start making a list of the props what page it's on, what act, scene, maybe not in that order because that's not a really good order now that I'm thinking about it for paperwork, but you get the idea. And you just make a a complete list of all of that. And then um, you can pass that on to your props department and they'll probably already have a list, but then you can kind of cross-reference, which is what I like to do. I take their list and my list and I kind of blend them together because sometimes they'll think of things that I don't think of and I'll think of things that they don't think of. And yep. I marry the two. So that way both stage management and the props department are on the same page. Um, and then the second half of the props paperwork that I do is um, a props tracking. So this is a little more in depth, which is where uh, I kind of put, I state who brings the prop on okay. and who brings it off. If it needs to be tracked to the other side of the stage while it's off stage, or even if it's dead, which means it's done for the show, it's never going to be seen or heard yeah. from again. Um, and I do that for almost every item. And some items, you know, I'll just put a notation that's just a set dress- dressing, which means nobody touches it. It doesn't move from the stage. It's just stationary, which is really important um, just for your mind. <laughs> Especially <laughs> if you have a, uh, if you're doing a show like Fiddler on the Roof, where there are so many hand props, it's really good to know what's actually stationary. Absolutely. Yeah. I that is the role I've played the most is Tevia. If you are on the roof, sounds yes. great. Yes. The village of Anatevka. <laughs> and there's tons of props. So many oh, props. Oh gosh. So many. I think that was the that and like the 39 steps are like the two shows that I think are the most prop heavy I've ever dealt with. Um so that's prop paperwork. Now a run sheet is kind of It has everything. So when you're backstage running the show, important things that need to happen, like if someone has a costume change, if a scene piece needs to move, or if you need to track something, or um, if you need to page a curtain as an actor's coming off the stage, anything that happens backstage should be documented in the correct chronological order. So that way, as a stage manager, I have that, running list and I can say or at least I know what's happening at all times 
And that's, that's really important, especially um, during a technical rehearsal where, every, where all the technical elements are coming in and you're adding costumes and things like that. It's so helpful to have an idea of what's happening um, and you can easily adjust, I say easily, um, you could see, you could start adding in elements into your run sheet and start deleting or start moving things around. Um, I hope this is all making sense. <laughs> it's just oh, yeah, a- totally. It is. It absolutely is. And I think, you know, um, a couple episodes back, we, we spoke with another uh, stage manager, Shay Candelaria, and um, she and I talked about a, a lot of the same things. And I think uh, in my mind, it, it, it is it comes back to I, in fact I, I called her and you're very much the same the Javert of the team you bring order to chaos right mm-hmm. um, and that's what that is I mean and and she talked about the consistency your job and you you, you know, when we spoke before you talked about that too your job is to keep the vision of the director and the producer and everybody on the creative team is to protect their vision from those silly actors that mm-hmm. you know want to go off and <laughs> do their own thing but having it all documented makes it possible to do that and keeps you sane. <laughs> it also keeps in a, in a very interesting way. It also keeps backstage safe because oh, if you absolutely. keep doing things the same way, the same time uh, you get, everyone gets into a habit. So that way um, if something goes wrong or whatnot, you know where everybody is for the most part, or you know where everything is. Absolutely, um, you can yeah. Help uh, troubleshoot or you know or whatnot, and um, that's I, good. I, I definitely, thought about that. But yeah, that's yeah. good. And it, yeah. it's funny. I'm definitely a creature of habit. So if I do something specific backstage, I need to be the one that does it. And if somebody thinks they're helping me by like moving something closer to me or going ahead, and they're like, "Oh, I have time. I can do that for them," I'm like, "No." <laughs> He's so do that. Yeah, it's not like, improv. I, it is not improv. <laughs> no. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was somebody who did that. I did that to another stage manager and I, and she's like, no, no, that's, that's what I do. And I didn't understand it until I was in her position. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's so right. Like I know during tech, I'm very much able to like pass things off onto somebody else. But once the show opens, then whatever's on my run sheet that's assigned to me, I do that. And whatever they do, you know, they do that. You know, it's just, it just keeps that, it keeps that order. It Absolutely. Keeps everything calm. I know and my biggest moments of panic when I'm in a show is when I go to get that prop that's my responsibility and somebody else has moved it. That's, yeah. uh, you're, like, you're like, where did it go? Yeah, did I put it somewhere the wrong place last time? Was it not preset? What was it? Exactly. And somebody, yeah. oh, I moved it. Wow. Yeah, and then no, find them later that. and have a discussion. That's what I try to remember. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, That's great. Yeah, um, and also it taught me, while at Riverside, uh, run sheets aside, kind of staying on the whole technical rehearsal aspect, um, it also taught me like how to support an actor. Um, You know, if you're doing a huge musical, you know, actors need their water or they need a towel to like wipe the sweat really quickly and you kind of pick up on your actor's needs. So you try to add that into your run sheet or just mentally note, be like, okay, I should be here with their water or I should make sure there's water like hidden on stage for them because they never come off stage. So that is something I learned while at Riverside and that I carry with me um, to every show is basically how to make the actor's jobs easier because they're the ones that are putting it all out there every night, you know, 110%. And that's something, like I said earlier, I cannot do. So how can I, as a stage manager, make their lives easier is kind of one of my um, goals throughout every production. Absolutely. Um, and as assistant, is there also some of that that you try to do for your program stage manager? I mean, is there a little bit of as my, as my production for my production, actually, yeah, stage, production manager? stage manager? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, especially during tech, um, I try to go out to when we're on a, like a 10 minute break or whatnot. I try to make sure if I'm not in the middle of doing something, I try to make my way out to the front of house where my state production stage manager is. And I like make sure that their water bottles filled. I try to if I know their favorite snack, I try to bring them their favorite snack or I try to make them like remind them to be like, Hey, 
go outside or like, you know, go use the restroom or things like, like little really reminders. Um, because I know when I stage man it, like when I'm the production stage manager, I forget to do all those things during tech. I'm just very focused. Right. So it's really helpful when somebody can come up to you and be like, go walk away. Take a you break. Your, take a break. Yep. Cool. Because a lot of us stage managers are workaholics and we just keep working <laughs> all through uh, our breaks. Uh, uh. Um, and that's not good sometimes. So, you know, make sure you just walk away. So I try to do that for my production stage manager. I also try to, during a rehearsal, during tech, I try to lift, alleviate anything from their plate and put it onto my plate. So um, whether that is, uh, I mean, I'll take notes on, on all props and costumes or things that come up that maybe they don't hear. Um, again, making sure that they have what they need, whether it's their post-its or their pencils are sharpened or things like that. Um, anything like that. Uh, I just want to make sure they have so much on their mind of, of, you know, working with all the designers and, you know, they have like 10 million voices coming at them. And, you know, if I can take something off their plate, I will and make sure that they don't have to worry about that. And right, I think that's a, that is a good um, trait to have as an ASM, somebody who's willing to support their, um, their production stage manager. Nice. That's good. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of what I really learned at Riverside. I also met uh, Kyle Atkins, who is a stage manager, and he is now the uh, associate producer at Riverside. And he, he was the one who really taught me uh, how to do paperwork and um, all the little things. He also taught me a really good trick to, if you have a huge cast, uh, like we were doing 42nd Street together and the first day of rehearsal, you know, they didn't do a table read or anything like that. They just started learning the opening number of 42nd Street. He gave me a huge pile of headshots and he's like, learn their names. So that's what I did during re the first part of rehearsal was like flip through those headshots, try to find them in the crowd and like learn their names. And that was so helpful because by the end of the first day, I knew who everybody was. I could go up to them and be like, hey, you know, Kristen, how are you? And she's like, oh, you know my name. You're like, yeah. She's like, that's so nice. It's just that it makes it a little more personable. That's awesome. Know everyone's name. So little tricks like that he taught me. He taught me like, so much. Um, but yeah, Riverside was my was a really good introduction to a professional. And you mentioned 42nd Street. Now, I, I just did. bring that up because we're going to hear it again and again. We are. And again. And <laughs> uh, was this I, the first 42nd Street in your life? This was actually the second. Already? The See, one, we're already yeah. <laughs> there was one that happened while I was at Lynchburg, which was at the Academy of Fine Arts. It was my first experience with 42nd Street. And um, my second was at Riverside. And then my third was at West Virginia Public Theater, which is where I went after Riverside. And that was by fluke because um, Kyle called me up and was like, so we need a PA because ours just left, or not, our, our ASM left, so we bumped up the PA, so I need a new PA, and I need you, like, today. <laughs> so, um, and if I remember I, correctly from when we talked before, there was some lag in there, right, after Riverside? There was. There, I, I, Riverside ended in May, and I went home and didn't know what was next, and so I got a job at the mall, and... Um, it wasn't until the first week in June I heard from Kyle, and that's, and then I left my job at the mall and packed up my car and went out to West Virginia. Awesome. Which, yeah, and so I, West Virginia Public Theater has a very interesting um, rehearsal and show schedule, um, and the first thing that's interesting about them is that when I was there in 2010 they didn't have a proper theater space. What they had was a huge ballroom in a hotel in which they brought in a stage, the seating, the trust, like they created their own theater within a huge ballroom, um, which was fascinating because, you know, you don't have the proper dressing rooms or, or, you know, you're sharing the back hallway with the kitchen staff. And it was just an experience of, you know, how to work differently and, you know, how to 
learning the quirks of a hotel and a theater at the same time was interesting. Adapt, um, adjust, and act. Exactly. And you just hit the ground running. You're like, okay. And that's great. That's, yeah, that's literally what I did when I got there. I hit the ground running because they were they had a week of rehearsal. They had a day and a half of tech. They opened, opened for a week, wow. closed, and the next show came in right after us. So was this a summer stock experience? This was a summer stock, yep. Yeah. And I did four or five musicals while there, one of them including 42nd Street. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have a great love of that musical. I have never seen it live. I've only worked it backstage. Um, <laughs> I saw a recording of it, um, but it's not the same. So <laughs> I'm hoping one day I'll see it done from the audience, but we'll see. That's great. Uh, yeah. Um, so West Virginia taught me how to work really fast, really, really fast and how to make sure that my run sheet was like perfection. And I mean, perfection in the sense of like, you just don't have the time to like TBD things. You, you just have to make sure everything is like planned out. Yeah, things will change and that's totally fine, but like it, everything had to be worked out beforehand. Um, and that's what Kyle Ingrid, who was the ASM and I did before every tech was that we would meet up, we would go through the show bit by bit and just make sure all three of us were on the same page of what needed to happen when and where. And that was really helpful um, because it's just the time crunch of everything. Um, so that, that learning how to think fast and on my feet was a great experience. And so glad I learned that while I was there and with, and with a stage manager that I worked with before because he knew my strengths and he knew my weaknesses at that point. And so he knew how to work with those, which was helpful. Um, but yeah. And then after that, I went back home to Maryland. I got a job because I still didn't know what was going to happen. And um, I applied to a lot of theaters in the area, uh, mainly in the DC, Maryland area, not really knowing what was going to happen. And nothing really did happen which was fine. That was totally fine. Um, and then Teresa from Lynchburg, she was working as a painter or a props master at a theater in Tennessee. And she was like, you know, we're holding URTAs, which is the University Resident Theater Association. Um, and she's like, and they have a job fair. Why don't you come and see what happens? And I was like, sure. What's the worst that can happen? So I went there. And I interviewed with uh, the Lost Colony, which is an outdoor theater in Manio, North Carolina, in the Outer Banks. And uh, they never, they did at that point, they didn't say I had it or not, but they were like, you have a pretty good chance of getting the position of a production stage manager. I was like, this is great. Um, and then later on, I, I happened to go to SCTC that year and met up again and kind of like showed my face to them to be like, hey, we met here. They're like, oh yeah, I remember you. So like, it was, it was great to like reconnect. They're like, we have you in mind, just, you know, hang out a little bit, you know, you'll hear from us. I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and then like, I great, found- but it, <laughs> let, It was great really to know like now. <laughs> <laughs> this way I can plan, but you know, that's okay. Um, and then I got the job as an ASM at the Lost Colony that summer of 2011 and I went down there um, and that was insane in a good way. Um, the Lost Colony has been, ha it's the same show for like, it's been happening for over 80 years now. And it's a huge outdoor space right on the water. Like the backstage is just water and you know, it's in a national park and uh, you're working with a cast of over a hundred people which was a little overwhelming at first. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you manage a hundred people? And when you got there, you, you learned that like they were broken down into groups, which was so helpful. So you had the principal actors who, you know, they could be an equity or non-equity. Um, most of them were non-equity. Um, you had a group called actor technicians or AT for short, who helped put up the set, maintain the set, 
who but also acted in the show um, and also helped facilitate scene changes during the show. Were a lot of had, like summer college intern types? A lot of them. No interns, but like definitely summer college jobs. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. And then you had dancers, a group of dancers. Same thing. Um, they didn't have a lot of... Uh, they didn't help with the set, but they, you know, focused on dancing, um, right. clearly. Um, and then we had a group, uh, we had the choir. So after having, like, almost 100 people, when you break them down into those groups, you're like, okay, that, that, that can be manageable, manageable. You can figure out how to schedule these groups and these people. Because, yeah. you know, as a stage manager, a huge part of your responsibility is scheduling. And, you know, choir would have choir practice, dancers would have their you know, rehearsal for dancing, obviously, the ATs would be the hardest to schedule because not only did they have to work on the sets and everything, but they also had to be in the, you know, they had, some of them had small roles that they had to be in rehearsal for. So they never balancing, slept. Yeah, they never, <laughs> no, they didn't. It was, they are the hardest working out of, well, people will argue with me. <laughs> Everybody was like the hardest working at the Lost Colony, but the ATs, during the rehearsal process, they they work they work their butts off. Yeah, and, and just they loved real, it. just real quick for everybody uh, listening, this is um, the 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 Lost Colony is one of those shows, and there are a few of them around the country that are like this. Mm -hmm. I think of Texas, obviously yeah. Texas. There's a show there where um, I, even being from the south, I have a lot of friends who would go there in the summer and work. Uh, Oklahoma, there's one that's not as big called Salagi. Uh, mm -hmm. and different mm -hmm. different parts of the country, and they are shows that have been around. Like the Lost Colony, when did it start? I mean, it's been around for years and years oh, and years. I, and years. I, like, I should know this. Thirties or forties, right? It was pre World War Two. It was pre World War Two because, like we were saying the other day, um, uh, World War Two was the first time they canceled the season because of the fear of the lights and everything like that. Right. And yeah. then COVID was the second time they've ever canceled the season. So it's, it's been around for a long time. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same play every year, right? It's not same like what you're going to do because it's a historical story related to the area. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, like little, like some directors take a little bit of liberty as to like certain aspects of the show. But for the most part is the same same thing every and that's year. because if you're a director and you value your life because the locals love that show and it is same. their show <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's i mean it's their know, town identity in a lot of cases it is um they uh, that's one of the things i think that's so addicting about going back to the lost colony is just the community and not just the people who are doing the show but like like we were saying the, the local community are just so supportive and will do anything, you know, um, they, they volunteer, you know, doing box office or, or uh, merchandising and like just, you know, they'll do things for the cast and crew. It, it's just a huge, I, I keep repeating myself, it's just a huge supportive community and you don't necessarily get that everywhere. Um, right. You do to a point, but this one was just so different. You know, everybody knows who you are and they're like oh you're working with the lost colony and you're like how do you know but they know they just know and it, it's a really good feeling and it's a good family feeling and you know that's great cool i have friends from there that you know are going to be my friends for life and that's just from doing like one show with them for one summer and that's it that's all it takes yeah, and, and one other, um, I think, a moment here, educational moment for our listeners. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about equity um, and equity contracts and things like that for actors and stage managers. Mm -hmm. um, and shows like The Lost Colony, and probably that it's it's a little bit of a rarity because uh, they are so old. They existed prior to some, some of the rules and things that are around mm -hmm. the different unions. Um, but the, it is a special kind of um, uh, an equity contract, right? Yeah, um, it, it, it's, it's a unique one, and um, it doesn't happen every year. They don't always get equity artists uh, or equ equity actors or stage managers every year. Um, but if they do, what they have is something called um, a guest artist agreement, I believe is the correct term. Um, and basically what that is, is it's an agreement between a university, 
uh, a nonprofit community theater or a non or nonprofit groups. Um, they have an agreement with equity um, to get permission to use uh, equity artists in their show. Um, and it's a very um, it's a very unique one um, because you're so used to as a union member working under like specific contracts at specific like um, equity theaters that this is just a very unique opportunity. Um, and I've actually worked as a guest artist at um, a couple of places before, um, one being Juilliard, um, because it's an educational setting, they're able to talk with equity to be able to allow me to join them. Um, yeah, because so a, a lot really of people don't, a lot of people don't know that once you become equity, it does limit what you can. It does. Yeah, it does. It, it, it limits what I feel like it limits you, but it also opens a, a door. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's um, pros and cons, obviously, but um, oh, it gives you the opportunity to do some bigger things. But a lot of people don't know then that you can't necessarily turn around and go home and be in the community no. play, theater play. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very different. And, and the guest artist isn't for everyone. Like, I mean, isn't for any organization stuff like that. It's very specific and you have to make sure you communicate with equity first before even reaching out to any um, artists that you want to have come join you. Um, so that's something really important as well. But yeah. Um, and also uh, going, not to backtrack, but uh, with becoming equity and how it kind of limits what you can do, um, I had the opportunity at Riverside to join equity and I decided not to for a variety of reasons, but one of them was Kyle mentioned that um, it's, a, it's too early, that you should wait it out. And I didn't quite understand what he meant. Um, but uh, I learned, I understood, I finally, it wasn't until maybe I was in grad school that I, I realized he was right because you, you want to make sure as a, at least for, as a stage manager, I always say you want to make sure that you have a good network before you take your card. You want to make sure that like the jobs that you're taking now, will you be still be able to take them when you're equity? And if the answer is yes, and if you feel like you have a good network, then take your card. It's a, it's a very personal decision. You shouldn't, um, don't think by taking your card that you're gonna get all these jobs now. You have to think about how your career is going and what your network is in order to then make that decision that you're ready to take your card and make that commitment. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And if you don't, I, yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but if you don't have that network big enough yet to get enough jobs to make money to eat, well, you yeah. get your equity card, you're not going to be able to do the other jobs either. Exactly. So, yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a hard decision, but like, <laughs> you know, yep. it's a good one. It's a good one. But yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, that was the Lost Colony. And I went back there for two more years. And the final year, I was the production stage manager, which uh, was really like my first time being a production stage manager since like college. And um, it, I, you know, in retrospect, I don't think I was ready, but <laughs> I made it work. I did what I could. Um, I learned how to call a show by my, you know, on my own, um, how to negotiate, not negotiate, but like, uh, learn the more political side of theater in the sense of like, you know, how to make my higher ups happy and, and things like that. And, you know, making sure that everything is okay, not just the backstage. And that was just a huge experience, but I had a really good team of ASMs and I had a really, really good department head that gave me the support and the knowledge that I needed to help me make me, to make me feel comfortable and confident in doing them at that job. Um, it was a really good learning, learning year. Um, and I also think that at that point, I realized that I like being an ASM better than a PSM, but very minutely. Like, I don't think I wanted to admit it, admit it then, but it kind of just started that idea. Um, so after that last season, I, well, during that season, I got a call from Networks Tours and they um, said that they needed an ASM to, for the Blue Man Group. And this was in the middle of the Lost Colony season. And I was like, I can't, you know, I can't leave this contract. Um, I had to finish it out. They're like, okay. 
And was that another SETC connection? It was. Uh, one of the last times I went to SETC, I interviewed with them and got along with their production managers who were the ones who were doing the interview. And um, they're like, okay, we'll be in contact. And I, that was in March, and I didn't hear anything until like July, end of July. Um, so after I said no to Blue Man Group, I was like, they're not going to call me again. They're just not. That's my feeling. They're done. <laughs> and, um, it wasn't until uh, like early September that they gave me a call and they're like, you know, why don't you come up and you interview? I was like, great, sure. And so I, they're based in Maryland and I was living in Maryland at the time. So it made it really easy. I went up there, I interviewed and halfway through the interview, I didn't realize what I was interviewing for. Like, was I a production stage manager? Or was I an ASM? Like what, what was, <laughs> what was the job? So I stopped the interview. I was like, what am I interviewing for? And they're like, for to be the PSM of Elf. I was like, oh, great, continue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I got the job and I was so nervous because I never toured before. I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, but they gave me the opportunity and I was like, I'm going to do the best I can to make this work, figure everything out, learn what I can and give it a go. And, that's what I did. And it was the same thing with Lost Colony. I had a really good core of um, department heads that traveled with us or traveled with me. And I, and they had, they were seasoned professionals on tour. And because of them, I learned a lot and I, they made me feel comfortable. They kind of gave me like little tips and hints about certain things that like maybe I didn't notice before. And they're like, Oh, you know, the, I knew stage manager who did this. And I was like, Oh, great. Okay. And that's, you know, how I learned. Um, it wasn't the best, but I, I made it work and I learned a lot. And again, a lot of thinking on my toes and making sure my actors felt safe and um, problem solving. <laughs> so, Is it fairly common for networks to hire um, a PSM with no tour experience? Have you, I mean, have you gotten a feel for that? Did you just luck out on that or they were just so impressed know. with you? <laughs> I, I mean, like to think I, they were so I, impressed. I'm sure that's what it was. I know I would have hired you. Um, I just, that's, yeah, I'm just curious if you ever thought about I, that or got any feedback. I, I never got any feedback about it, but I feel like the fact that I, my background up until then has been large musical, like has musicals and like a large cast and how to manage uh, a huge group of people um, for a period of time. I think I would like to say that's maybe why they gave me a chance. Yeah. Um, I think it's also being personable and like getting along with them. It just shows that you'll be able to adapt to a variety of people, which is what happens when you're on tour. You, you go to different theater houses and you meet their local crew and, you know, you meet their, you know, the local staff and, you know, being able to be personable to them help, you know, it's beneficial to both sides and you just make, make good light friendships with everyone and everyone works together in a much easier manner than if Absolutely. you're That's not why that, that way. That advice is all over our board of wisdom. Our wall of wisdom is full. Yeah. Of, be enjoyable. Be nice. It's a small yeah. community. People remember you. That's great. Exactly. And, you know, I only did one tour, but I know other people have done multiple, like, you know, go back to the same houses. And because they had such a good uh, friendship with the locals there, you know, it made that show go up much easier or better or whatnot. So it, it's just very helpful to keep a really good attitude. And, and that's something you really, I learned while on tour. Um, also learning how to work with IATSE, uh, a union crew, because that was something I'd never done before. And I didn't know what I can and can't do. But like, again, luckily, my head carp just laid it out for me. He's like, don't do that. Don't touch that. desk. <laughs> I was like, okay, I won't, I won't, I won't. Um, and there were times, there were a couple times I got not yelled at, but a little scolded by, by the locals. I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> But they were, a lot of the time they were understanding and they just kind of let certain things slide. But I mentally like filed that away for next time. Trial by fire. So, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you just do it with a smile and you say you're sorry and it's okay <laughs> most uh -huh. of the time. Um, but yeah, I, I think I was really happy I went on tour because it just, 
every every experience up into you know that you go to at every theater or every company, everything works differently for each theater. And like, touring just adds a whole nother element of, like I said, you're going to different theaters and different places and you have to be prepared for those places before you get there um, for, you know, how the layout of the theater is, what are some quirks about that theater, you know, you just have to make sure you're prepared and you're ready and you are able and willing to make uh, sacrifices, like not sacrifices, that sounds dramatic, but like, you know, not every theater is the same size. Some theaters are smaller and, you know, there were sometimes we had to cut certain um, props because they were just too big or like, you know, certain scenic pieces that flew in, we had, we would have to make the decision, or at least I would have to make the decision to officially cut them from the show and then explain that in a report as to why it got cut. Yeah. Um, which is something, you know, you've never, I never had to experience before. Um, it's kind of cool having that power. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's also logistical. Like you have to be logistic. You can't, be precious about everything. Sometimes you just have to let something go. And that was something I learned um, while on tour. Well, and you know, it goes back to the things that you, that were the traits that originally allowed you to love being a stage manager, right? Being yeah. flexible, being creative, creative problem solving. Those were the exactly. things that even back in college at Lynchburg mm -hmm. that you yeah. loved. So that's cool. I mean, it just solidifies the fact that, hey, this, this is a good thing. I do yeah. like this. And then, and then the other thing I learned on tour was like calling from backstage. So prior to this, anytime that I was involved in calling a show, I was in the booth, which is in the front of house. And this time I called from backstage. So I had two monitors that showed me the front of house view of the stage. So I called from that. And I also was the first time dealing with cue lights. Yeah. And, and cue lights will be new to a lot of our yeah. viewers. So just give us, can you give us a quick rundown what, what those are? Sure. Cue lights can be used for a variety of different things. Um, sometimes they could be used to let an actor know that they can, you know, make their entrance. And so what it is is that there will be a light um, positioned someplace backstage near an entrance uh, for this instance. And when the light goes on, that tells the actor to, like, stand by. You're about to enter. And when uh, the light goes off, they enter. And it's the same concept for if they have a cue light up on the fly rail. Um, if a light turns on, they're like, stand by, you're about to bring in a piece of scenery or you're about to fly out the piece of scenery. And as soon as that light goes off, they'll make that move. And it could be used for, like I said, for the fly rail, for backstage, for scenic changes, or um, even used at the front of house for uh, a sound cue or a light cue or however a stage manager and uh, actors, not really the actors, but like, Whatever state, wherever a stage manager feels like there's going to be need a cue light is needed, that's what they're used for. Nice. Um, and um, in my backstage calling area, I had this um, row of like switches, and th those were my cue lights. So they were all labeled as to where the cue light was uh, located. And then in my call book, I would make sure I would state like turn on cue light for blah and like I would verbally say that over headset like cue light going off for blah 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 and when the time to go happened I would just switch those lights off uh, in however whatever order and I wouldn't have to verbalize a, jo a geo because I would be saying very southern geo so it took yes. words out of my mouth that I didn't have to say which is nice. helpful um, and then one time it was our first uh, show uh, without our higher ups in the audience because it was the first show out of tech. We were in Florida and I turned, I was in a sequence where a lot of things were going to happen and I was hitting all my cue lights to stand by everybody. And I hit one and the cue light like popped out. Of oh the, no. Of the thing. <laughs> and I was just like, so I, my mic was open. So every, my like headset was open so everyone could hear me and all they hear me going was like no 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 and everyone's like what's happening, what's happening? I feel like broke. and so it was the moment of like I'm gonna have to call that cue along with all these other cues so it was like immediate like having to like problem solve right then and luckily my um 
A2 and somebody else were there right away trying to fix the Q light because I was the idiot who tried to put the light back in the switch and it sparked and and do I remember you saying that a Renee Levine, one of our yes, that was Renee. Yay, Renee. She Yay, is Renee. Star. <laughs> um, so at the end, Oliver, who was the master electrician on the show, he was like, "So we're gonna have to replace your Q light board because you know you broke it." <laughs> uh, so and I still have the little switch. Um, I, I happen to steal that and save it. Um, so a little reminder. <laughs> But that was my first time like dealing with cue lights on tour and um, learning how to say all these new words on the fly, you know, making it work. Um, yeah, a lot of firsts happen on tour, um, but that was one of the memorable ones. Um, and then after tour, I decided that I should go to grad school. And that decision took, I was thinking about that for a while. I think ever since I was at the Lost Colony in 2013, um, I was just thinking about how I learned so much on the job, but I felt like there were like holes in my, uh, in my education and I wanted to uh, fill those. And um, I was glad I waited so many years afterwards because it, it definitely solidified that I wanted to be a stage manager. Um, and doing this will just continue on. Um, so I applied to at, uh, applied to Rutgers for the grad program in stage management, and it was the only one I applied to, um, probably because I was a little lazy and didn't apply anyplace else. But um, I wanted a place that was close to the city, not because I thought I was going to be a New York stage manager, but I just thought that was the best place to go. And um, I got in and. I went that fall uh, in 2014 to grad school and learned so much. Um, I met Leslie Leiter and Christine Whalen and Don Holder and a bunch of other teachers at Rutgers and they just showed me so much and taught me so much about myself, um, not just as a stage manager, but as a person that then paved this way to help me get where I am now. Um, they taught me so how to like hone in my- It was like the turbo boost that you needed to, to really- it, level. it really was. I, I like to say I was like in this like little small box and I never liked to leave my box of comfort. And they were the ones that just broke that box apart and pushed me <laughs> into all these things that I, I never thought I would do. Um, they pushed me into cold emailing a stage manager on Broadway asking if I can come shadow them while I call the show. And there I would go. never have done that on my own. So um, that was, they, they did that. And along with teaching me um, other ways to be a stage manager. And, and one of them was um, to be more present within the room, within the rehearsal, uh, uh, rehearsal room. And to not just, be in your computer or be in your book, but listen to what the director's saying, what the actors are saying, um, because it just gives you a different view on the show. Uh, it gives you more of a backstory of like each character or the show itself, which then kind of helps you in the long run to keep the artistic integrity of the show. Nice. Um, but it also lets you feel like you're a part of it in a way. Um, and they also allows, allowed me to feel like I'm creating this safe world in which the art can grow. Um, and that was a huge thing that I learned there was to create a room of trust and safety because to put yourself out there as an artist, you know, it, it only takes one moment, uh, whether that be, you know, a look or a word or something like that that can just immediately break a trust in a room. And you never want that because you want the actors to be able to be brought to where they need to be for a show. Does that make right. sense? Absolutely. And yes. yes. I think that's a huge part of a stage management job aside from the logistics. I think being that person that they can go to if they need anything is really important. Um, yeah, so you're and, nurturing and cultivating the environment in which the art can happen. 
exactly. Protecting you, that. You're like the gardener, right? Um, yes, exactly. It and watering <laughs> yeah, just, that and keeping those plants happy so that the exactly, magic happens. Exactly. And um, you just want it to bloom as, as, as beautifully as it can. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a really good thing to watch. It's, it's a fun thing to watch, I think. Um, but yeah, um, they definitely, they definitely taught me that. And, um, I, I was so thankful that they have, cause I, have carried that along with me, um, to my shows now. And also side note, it also helps your reports, rehearsal reports when you let people know what's happening. Um, because I think the reports are there not only to make sure that the information of what needs to get said to each department gets said, but also for those who are not in the room to let them know what's happening within the room, to make them feel a part of it, even though they are not there. Um, so I think that that is helpful as well to be able to. Well, and you mentioned something when we, we've spoken before uh, that you learned, I think about this time, a great discipline that really helped you bring that focus. And that was journaling. Is that is this the time that yes. you get to really journal? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, Le Leslie and Christine wanted us to, I say us, um, the BFAs and the MFAs that were in the class together. Um, they wanted us, whenever we were in a rehearsal process, we had to write a journal entry after every rehearsal. And it was, their focus was like, don't always focus on the negative because it's really easy to focus on the negative. Like somebody <laughs> didn't listen or like, you know, this happened and made me feel this way. But they were like, really listen, what, observe what's happening in the room. And, and being able to do that helped me because I, I watched the either attention rise in the room or attention release and you, you got to see notice if a certain actor was has a very emotional journey throughout a show um or you will notice if certain people get along or not and and also just the the art as well you you can just you journaling allowed you to like while in rehearsal, you can observe the art, but the journey allowed me to also write about write my thoughts down about what was happening. Like if I agreed, or if I made a, if I had an idea about about the show itself, it allowed me to form my own opinion. But really, in the long run, it, it helped me watch, really watch what was in the room. Yeah, it, um, it kind of was just a good physical reminder to focus and to listen, because yeah. you have to listen if you're going to reflect. That's, exactly. that's, that's wise. That's really wise yeah. to do yeah. that. That's great. Um, and it also helped you fo uh, really listen to the director, which is important as well, and where they're coming from um, as, as a director with the show and stuff like that. Because I've had really good conversations just one-on-one -on -one with directors after a rehearsal when they're just talking to you about what happened or they like if a certain actor made a breakthrough or things like that, or they'll even ask you your opinion sometimes. And if you're not paying attention to what's really going on, you know, the director is asking you for your opinion, and you're like, uh, you can't just give a fake answer. You want to give a genuine answer. So, and it's also rare that, a, not rare, but like not all directors want your opinion. It's such a special opportunity. Um, and you want to work with them again later, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> right? I mean, those I, are the moments where you're going to impress them and, and make them think, hey, this this person knows what they're doing. This yeah, is good. Exactly. So it, it it's all these things that you have to remember as a stage manager, which not everyone realizes. A lot of, like a, a lot of us, a lot of people think stage managers are just about the paperwork and just about keeping people on schedule and things like that. Which, while those things are true and they're important, there's this other side of us that like, we're humans too, and we're a part of this art form as well, even though it doesn't appear that we are. Um, no, yeah, you're just yeah. as important as the rest just of everybody. As, yep. yes, you're a star. We keep, I keep telling you, I'm going to get you. You're a star, just like everyone else. That's great. Don't put me on stage. <laughs> uh, hey, that's all right. You can shine from wherever you are. <laughs> um, but yeah, after grad school, um, I graduated in 2016 fall of 2016 um, in December and um, since then I immediately got a job in the city as a projection assistant with Pacific 
uh, with the show Pacific Overtures at uh, the Classic Stage Company, CSC. And how did that um, come about? How did you get that lead? Um, I was on book at uh, Two River Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey, um, for a show called Hurricane Diane. And the first day I was there, the production manager came up to me and he was like, so our PA has to go to our other show. Do, would you be willing to take over the run of the show? I was like, sure, gladly. And so that's what I did. And the stage manager, Melanie Lisby, um, her and I got along really well. And she, one day she came up to me, she's like, do you like musicals? I was like, yeah, I like musicals. And she's like, okay, um, I'm going to reach out to you about something. I was like, okay. And so she got me, a, she asked me to be her production assistant on the, her, the musical. Um, and that's how that, that's how that worked. Um, that's awesome. Just by chance. Yeah. And so um, that was my first show in the city, which was an eye opener because you had to learn where, you know, where everything is. You had to learn where the nearest Staples was and Walgreens and Dwayne Reed and, you know, learn the north side versus the south side of the streets and and whatnot. And um, that was that was really fun. (laughs) It was fun. It was it was an eye opener. But I had such a good support system of the stage management team that made me feel comfortable with asking questions and making sure that what I need to do was very clear and, and, you know, also enjoy it. Be in a room with, you know, professional actors again in New York city, which just had this shine to it. And it, it was the best experience. That's, that's um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's, I just, since then just, you know, just kept working, kept networking, um, used my friends to reach out to, you know, other stage managers, had coffee dates and met stage managers and other people in the industry just to, you know, to learn and to network and things like that. And, um, how much of those, how much of those ties came from the relationships you made at Rutgers? You know, a lot of them, a lot of them. Um, some of them came from the class that I graduated with. Um, a lot of them came from the class I graduated with because we all keep in contact. We're still friends. We have a, we have a text messaging group. We're still bouncing jobs back and forth to each other. Um, but one of them, one of the main networking things that I did was I asked Don Holder because he works in the city all the time. I asked him, who do you think are stage managers I need to meet? And he emailed me right away with a list of stage managers and was like, I already let them know that they're, you're going to email them. And I was like, oh, great. Okay, cool. Uh, and oh, I, that you better reach out. Cause I, yeah, exactly. Which is good that he did that. Cause that's a good, like kick in the butt to like, that's man, right. Good job, Don. Good job. Good job. And, like, I can't let you down. So um, let me email these people. And I did. And I just asked them if they had time for me to, for us to meet for coffee or, um, or whatever, and just talk about the industry and things like that. And um, that's how I met a lot of stage managers and made really good connections. And um, one of them was Scott Rollison. And, you know, we met in August of 2017 and, you know, just met for coffee and um, talked about the industry and, and how he made it, like how, what his journey was and what he thinks, uh, stage management is and things like that and I learned so much and we we I felt like we clicked really well and he at the end of it he was like um send me your resume after this and uh if anything comes up I'll pass it along that was great awesome <laughs> thank you so much and um I walked away with like sending in my uh resume and things like that but with the expectation that nothing would happen um, which is how I went with this, because you never want to assume you're going to get a job from any of these coffee dates, because they're just really innocent, you know, just getting to know the other stage yep. manager. Um, so yeah, I didn't if hear you put anything. too much, if you put too much expectation, you'll drive yourself nuts, right? Exactly. Or you'll come off as some crazy person. So like, no, <laughs> just go in with no expectation. Blocked on Facebook, blocked on yeah, Twitter, exactly. blocked on Instagram. <laughs> so um, I didn't hear from him and um, it wasn't until that November that he was like I'm doing a reading of Tootsie would you like to be my PA it's like yeah sure which is so exciting because you know there are rumors of this going to Broadway and things like that and you're like oh this is like my first 
like Broadway, you know, thing. You know, this is really exciting. I, this is awesome. So, um, and it was just really fun to be in that room with all that talent and just see how a reading happens and everything. And um, I did that. And he's like, we should do this again sometime. I was like, yes, please. And, you know, um, he asked me to do another one in February and I couldn't because I was just about to go into a tech for another show and I couldn't leave that. And then um, through the, uh, but I also told him to please keep me posted because I want to be involved and um, didn't hear anything. Um, that March in 2018, I did the lab of Beetlejuice because of my friend uh, Matt was on it and he put my name out there and I did that and that, that was show. a lot of fun. Yeah, I so got to see fun. the early productions of that, man. Yeah. So good. So good. So Alex, good. Amazing. But Alex Brightman can't be on this show because he gets to be a star everywhere. I know. I don't want to talk I don't want to talk to him. I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I found out through the grapevine that they were interviewing for PAs for the out of town tryout of Tootsie and I you know, got enough courage to email Scott. And I was like, Hey, I heard this is happening. If you're still having interviews or, you know, or whatnot, I would love the opportunity if at all possible. And he's like, Oh yeah. So we set one up and it just so happened. My roommate had the interview right before me. Um, so both of us, you know, were in, you know, both had this opportunity, but both of us wanted to get it, but it, it was just so nerve wracking. That never happened to me before, but, um, I had that interview in like April or May, and then I heard in June, he texted me saying that I got it, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and my roommate was super happy. She was like, oh, I'm so glad you got it. So uh, I felt supported by her, but I was also really excited because it was my first, like, you know, Broadway out of town tryout um, with the show. And that was in Chicago, is that right? Did I that was in Chicago, and I didn't go with them to Chicago. I was just in New York for <laughs> rehearsals. Um, so they had another, they had, there was three PAs in New York, two went to Chicago, they hired a PA in Chicago, and then, um, so I didn't go with them, but that's okay, um, because I had such an amazing experience in New York with them, um, working at New 42, which is a um, rehearsal space that's, that's known for uh, housing Broadway shows for rehearsal, and it was just you know, the experience of working in that, you know, rehearsal space and with all these huge people, you know, huge names and producers and, and these amazing group of stage managers. Um, and New and 42, is that on 42nd Street? It is on 42nd Street. <laughs> it is. Once again, um, it comes out. if you ever play the lottery, <laughs> just great 42s, all the way, every choice. It really is. Um, <laughs> So um, I did that, and then um, they went to Chicago, and I went back to just working all over in the city. And um, and just real quick, again, I'll pull back. Uh, New 42, just uh, not not having to go into great depth, but um, th that's a, a kind of a professional rehearsal space, right? That's that it is. production yes. is going to rent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very and good. And there's like a there's a few other smaller rehearsal um, companies like that throughout the city, like Ripley Greer or Pearl Studios. Um, and there's one in Chelsea that I can't remember the name of. It used to be Chelsea Studios, but I believe they changed it. Um, but they're all over because in the in, in New York, you can't really necessarily work in the, rehear in the theater that you're going to put your show on. Um, so you have to rent out these rooms in these various places to be able to rehearse your, your show or even hold auditions and, and things like that. So they're kind of numerous ones all over the city. Um, I bet those are fun to... places to be in because, you know, they there's are. a lot of space, a lot of things going on. That's exactly, kind of you just see like certain postings about like auditions for like the Lion King tour or, you know, the, at one point I saw a sign for the um, Super Bowl choir is rehearsing and it's just fun just to see what's happening. Um, even if you're not involved, that also keeps you current on things that are, might be coming up because you just see certain show names and you're like, oh, yeah. okay, okay. Um, but yeah, and then I, uh, in 2019, I did the, I did Tootsie on Broadway as a PA and. Um, very exciting stuff. Did you feel very, like I've made it? This is I, it. Yeah, like see your. <laughs> 
see your name in the program on like page. I think my friend took a picture of it, like page twenty six or something like that. Um, she's like, "Look, your name's in the program." I'm like, uh, oh my uh, god! And was that the opening? I mean, you were part of the first crew to go in and and open. I yes. So as a production assistant, your job is all the way. You go through the rehearsal process, tech previews, and then opening night's your last day. So you actually get to see the show from the audience on opening as a PA. And that's that was, cool. They let you hang because they could yeah. like a week before, right? But no, that's big of a mess. Uh, it depends, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'm glad that they let us stay till opening, which is yeah, which that's was, very cool. Yeah, it just makes you feel part of the um, a part of the show, you yeah. know. And you get a Broadway um, credit. That's legit. And I have a Broadway credit. Yeah, um, it was just so much fun. Uh, it was amazing, um, and that cast and crew are just well. They were lovely people. Um, the show closed, but like they were just lovely, lovely human beings. I was happy to be a part of it. Um, and then I just have been working around the theater, uh, around New York ever since. I um, recently, in January, I actually went back to Riverside Theater for like, not on purpose, but like 10 years from when I originally was there uh, to work with Kyle again on a show down there. And it was so fun going back there because it was like almost like going home. And um, it was it was nice to be back there as a uh as an equity ASM, because it's like everything I learned from there, I have refined since then, and I'm bringing it back to where it like kind of all began. So it was really cool to be back down there and to kind of show what I learned or what yeah. I knew, or not really show off, but like utilize everything. So were there any little Christines running around that reminded you of you back 10 years before? Oh, yeah, because they had a couple of apprentices there and, and that I kind of ran into and doing jobs. That I was like, oh, I remember doing that. Or, <laughs> or, you know, I remember having to work with that cork before or, or things like that. It was it was kind of, yeah, it was it was neat to see. Um, because what's also crazy is that not only was Kyle there, um, another stage manager, Audrey Brown, who was a stage manager when I was down there, she was there at the same time. And then another two stage managers that I worked with at another summer stock, Main State Music Theater, they were there. So it was, it was like, like a all big these, reunion. Wow. It was like a little mini reunion of all these people that I, I worked with that I learned from and putting everything that I gained uh, That's from wonderful. everyone in one place. It was, it was really kind of cool. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that's kind of my story of a stage manager. And I, like I said, I just have been working and keep working ever since and uh, can't wait to see what the future holds for what's next. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, it's a great story. I knew it would be, you know, <laughs> uh, so much wisdom and, and just a lot of really good stuff in there. So thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, uh, just a couple other things here. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'd love to hear is um, you mentioned briefly, you know, you kind of at one point begin to realize, I think maybe being an ASM more than more than a production stage manager and mm -hmm. assistant is more your ticket. Is there a is that something you've thought more about and kind of identified the why behind that thought? Um, yeah, I I still PSM a lot, um, but. What I like about ASMing is that you're you are backstage, you're with the actors, you just have a more personable experience with them. Yeah. And I just like that camaraderie. And not that you have you don't get that as a PSM. As a PSM you just have to deal with a lot more um, you have to deal with the, the designers more and a little you, you kind of step away from the the relationship that you have with the actors and what goes on backstage. Yeah. So there's that aspect of it. But I also love being backstage because I love how everything works. I love being able to create a scene transition or plan out a scene transition that just happens so smoothly and so perfectly that, you know, when the reveal happens, the audience claps because they're like, how did you do that? And I love that sense of pride uh, that comes with that, which sounds silly, but no, you know what? It's funny you say that because I actually, um, in my theater world, that's one of the things that I 
love to do as well is to chore I chore I mean we call it choreographing we choreograph the yeah. trip. Yeah. And you know, um, of course you're on a much different level than I am. But oh, we no, still no, no, no. You know, run the clock and we we try to get the time down. And yeah, yeah. And I've, I've often said I'm going to write a textbook over how to do that because I've never found one I liked. There, yeah, it's it's such a like also learning on the job and trying yeah. to like figure it and time everything out. And also There's, taking time to see how the, the piece of scenery moves. Because I, yeah. I remember doing that for another transition. It's just like, how does this piece move and how can I move it smoothly? And can I put anything on this? to then be easier yeah. to move later on sure. you know playing tetris backstage with like where can you put your prop table can you have a prop table do you need a prop shelf you know it things like that true. and i've even coined a phrase around it it's my philosophy of set transition i call it conservation of movement mm -hmm. we've got to conserve our movement why are you going on and off stage three times to move those three chairs when we could move them all together at one exactly conserve yes. your movement so i get yeah. you I get it's, you. That's good. It's just uh, that is fun. so fun. And you get it's a dirty. I, what? It's a puzzle. It is a puzzle. It really yeah. is. And and you get your hands dirty. And I, I just like getting my hands dirty. And I like being there. If something goes wrong backstage, I can be there to like try to fix it or troubleshoot or, or whatnot. And I I like that responsibility. I like that. So That's cool. But well, PSM has its... um perks too but asm oh, is, is yeah and and uh if you're out there looking for a psm don't don't think i'm saying she doesn't want a job <laughs> <laughs> well, i like psm too <laughs> yes she would she would gladly talk to you about that pain position. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but uh so two last things here um christine that are uh, some of my favorite things uh, on our show. And one of those is I just love to hear people verbalize the passion behind what you do. Why do you love it? Um, and we've heard a lot of it, but just if you can succinctly kind of put into words, what are the things that you, if you would say, as someone would just walk up and say, Christine, Kelowna, what is it? Why do you love being a, a stage manager? What gets you up in the morning and gets you jazzed about it? I like being in a room and watching just, the beginnings of an idea and just watching it grow from beginning all the way to the end because in any other department I don't feel like you get that experience and I love like I said earlier I love being able to be in that room and to create that world for the actors, for the director, for the designers and things like that. I want to be their support system. And that is what I love. I love being there to support people in what they love to do and in their, also in their vision and in their own passion. And that is my passion is to help those people in their art and that's wonderful. I, it, it's, it's just a privilege to be a part of that. And that's yeah. what makes me go every morning to the you, job, whether that's in rehearsal or even during a run of a show. Yeah. It's just to keep that story being told, whatever it is. That's great. You love serving the show. I do. I really that's do. Wonderful. Well, they're blessed to have you uh, <laughs> for sure. I can guarantee you because you obviously do love what you do. And that is great. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm, um, thank you. So it's time for the wall of wisdom. You knew it was coming. I know, I know. <laughs> you've had friends on the show. You've seen, you knew it was coming. So uh, it, yeah, I like to tell people, if you had the opportunity to think back and, and or send a limited text that Jamie can fit on a piece of gaff tape to young Christine back years and years ago, give her that wisdom, that nugget of truth. What would that be? Um. It's going to sound lame. Um, have fun. That's not lame uh, at all. You are being paid to play pretend. That is wonderful. And, you know, in what world do you get that opportunity? Um, so have fun. Be respectful. Be focused. But remember, you're having fun. All right. That is that's wonderful. I love that you are paid to pretend. Yeah, you don't have to grow up. Maybe wow. that's why I love theater so much because I've refused <laughs> to grow up over all these years. Yeah, it's it's so fun. It's and you just have to remember that things can get serious so fast, but yep. 
you have to keep it light, you know? Uh, who? Oh, Emma Bogave. Emma is a wardrobe supervisor. Um, latest show is the tour of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh. And her advice was, it's only a show. Yep. And same kind of thing. And she actually, so, uh, she had um, a mentoring person over her once who, I guess she was quite upset one day at a loadout. And the person said, Emma, it's only a show. It's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's true. But that's great. So I've got it right here. Have fun. You are paid to pretend. I love it. And I'm running out of room, but we're going to get oh, you right no. up here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. You know what? We'll put you over here by Renee, your buddy. Yay. Oh, Renee. Renee. <laughs> I am running out of room. I'm going to figure something out. That's all right. That's good. <laughs> So much wisdom on that board, and now you are a part of it yeah. forever. Yay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> or until the tornado blows away my trailer. But oh. I'll, I will hunt them down if that happens. I will hunt them down because okay. they're, they're worth it. But thank you so much uh, for being a, a part. And there's one last thing that we do, and that mm -hmm. is this. You don't ever get to go out for a curtain call. They don't let you do that, which uh, I think they should. And so as our star of the day, I represent all of Broadway and national tour and musical loverhooddom. That's a thing. All the people, millions worldwide, that if they were with me would absolutely give you this. And this is your, your ovation, your, I would stand up if there was room in my trailer, but there's not, uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be pretty anyway. Uh, but this is for you. So thank you, Christine, for being a star. We love you. And, and you deserve much more than that. But there you go. You have now had your own personal curtain call. And it, it was more than deserved. So uh, you truly are a star. And we thank you for being a part of our Hidden Star of Theater family. So thank you for your time today. Oh, good. Awesome. Well, um, and, and you know what? That's it. We're done. We've got uh, uh, more episodes coming, everyone. So be sure, hey, if you haven't done it yet, Right down below, find the buttons, like, subscribe, share us with all of your friends and all of your Instagrams and Facebooks and all of those crazy things you kids do, please, because we want everybody to see our stars and everybody to, to learn through what they say and share. Uh, but mostly we want them to get to know them because they're worthy of being known. And so do that. Subscribe, share, uh, whatever else you need to do to get the word out there. But um, uh, thank you for joining us today. You are always one of our stars as well. Find a place, find a stage, make art. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about being a stage manager, Google it. E email me if you have questions and I'll get those to Christine. And I'm sure that uh, she'd be happy to get those answered for you. But we would love for you to um, just let us know if you want to learn more. But again, thank you. Everybody have a great day. And we'll see you next time right here on the Hidden Stars of Theater. Bye-bye.